Yeah, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, before we get too deep into this, uh, I just want to say two things. One, you know, like I mentioned, I started paying attention to this a few months ago, so I'm far from an expert. Um, so you know, don't invest your life savings into something based on anything I say here. And two, um, I wasn't quite sure how many people would show up to this, so I don't. Uh, this isn't as much a talk necessarily as perhaps a group discussion. So if you have questions or whatever, feel free to interrupt. You won't derail me because there there really are no rails. You know, I'm just. <laughs> but uh, in terms of the presentation tonight, uh, I wrote four blog posts uh, a while ago about this crypto miner build, and I figured what I would do is is use these essentially as my slides to talk about the build process. So you know, we'll we'll start by talking about physically building a crypto miner, and then after that, if anybody would like to discuss cryptocurrencies more broadly, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to entertain that. But let's kick it off here. So the, the, uh, the blog posts I wrote, there, there are four, and um, I start by discussing the physical build of the hardware, then uh, discuss some BIOS changes I had to make to uh, get the thing working, then talk about financially optimizing the mining strategy that I was going with, and then lastly I talk about uh, com compute optimizing the hardware, you know, clock cycles and power consumption and stuff. So let's start by discussing the physical build first here. Oops. All right. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, a couple of months ago I became interested in Ethereum when, it, when the price spiked. That caught my attention. I decided maybe to try to get in on this, maybe try to learn something from, from this. Um, but I'd, I'd never done any mining before myself. Like I mentioned before, there were some guys here a long time ago that, that mined Bitcoin. So I was um, kind of vaguely aware of, of the hardware involved and, and how you went about it. But um, still, it, it, was, it was mostly new information to me. So I started the uh, hardware build just by doing a bunch of internet research to figure out, you know, what, what hardware do you even need to mine crypto? Because I, I didn't really know. And I, I, I quickly turned up a, a guy, his name is Crypto Badger, or his handler, or whatever, is Crypto Badger, who, had, who has a, a really uh, impressive blog about this. And I, I recommend you guys check him out if you have, uh, you know, if you want to learn about this stuff. And what I learned from him, kind of as the, uh, the bottom line important points here, is that, you know, when you're building a miner, uh, one, these things have a lot of power draw. So I, you know, I learned, you know, I, I need a beefy power supply with uh, ideally with some headroom beyond what the GPUs will consume. And when I say GPUs, we'll talk about that later, but basically, at least for Ethereum, you want to use graphics cards for your mining. And, and you want that headroom because if you look at the efficiency curves on power supplies, what you find is that they become less efficient beyond a certain threshold, I, I, I assume as, um, as the probably as the need to dissipate heat increases, but I'm, I'm not sure. So, you know, so you want to buy a power supply with headroom beyond what the rig will consume. Um, I, I've learned that at, at least at the time that I wrote this a few months ago, few motherboards on the market had a sufficient number of PCIe slots for attaching the GPUs. Um, and, and it's funny, like I said, you know, I, I, I built this thing maybe two or three months ago. And at the time, that was a correct statement. I had to look really hard to find a motherboard with six slots for six GPUs. But uh, maybe a month ago, um, I think it was Asus started releasing boards with like 19 PCIe slots <laughs> in, in regards to you know, the, 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 this particular goal. So that, that's not as much of a problem as it used to be. And, and now you're seeing more tailored hardware for this, for this use case. I learned that uh, few GPUs are optimal for mining, and, and specifically, I'm talking about optimal in terms of hashes per watt. Um, you know, as something like an Ethereum miner, this is hardware you're going to turn on and, and run pretty much indefinitely. So uh, it, it can really uh, run up your electric bill if you don't get energy efficient hardware. And lastly, I learned that aside from the GPUs, provided that you're only going to use this computer for, for mining, uh, powerful hardware is of little importance. CPU doesn't really matter. RAM doesn't really matter. You know, the, the only thing that matters are, are GPUs for, for F mining. So with, with those um, discoveries made, then I, I took a look at the GPUs that were available on the market and ultimately decided to go with the GTX 1070 because um, 
w w what I found is, is again, back to the energy efficiency uh, thing here. GTX 1070s tend to be very efficient in terms of hashes per watt. And uh, importantly, um, th that really matters to me in Florida here, because as you guys know, it's like 100 degrees over the summer. And my assumption was that a lower power GPU would, would also uh, run cooler. And, you know, I, I wanted to minimize the extent to which this mining rig heated up my apartment. Because uh, the thing is like six feet from where I sit all day, and I just didn't want to deal with that. So, I, so I, I, I decided on the GTX 1070, and then made some other um, relatively unimportant decisions. I, I, I purchased two uh, hard drives, the, the laptop form factor drives. I, I, I picked up an SSD for the operating system, and then an SSHD, which if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's essentially a, a hybrid HDD and SSD kind of in one package. Um, to to store blockchains, so I had a drive for OS and a and a drive for blockchains. And uh, there's a bill of materials at the end of this blog post if if you guys care. But but like I said, beyond the GPUs, um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, yes, question. Uh, as someone new, what do you mean by hashes per watt? What are what are hashes? Okay, so so hashes. Um, th 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 this can. This is an incredibly detailed topic to answer that <laughs> in depth, but but essentially uh, the 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 fifty thousand foot overview is that you know Ethereum like Bitcoin is a blockchain based technology, and the blockchain is what you would call a distri distributed ledger, um, a, a, a ledger more specifically of of financial transactions, fi financial in, in the currency. You know, so in this case, Ethereum, not U.S. dollars. The the way the way transactions are verified on the blockchain is through incredibly computationally expensive um, cryptographic hashing. Uh, I'm I'm not a crypto guy, but essentially, cryptographic hashing is the process of taking any arbitrarily any arbitrary amount of data input and reducing it to a string of characters. Uh, a hash function is de deterministic, such that given a, a specific input, you'll always get exactly the same output. And it is, uh, at, at least on paper, it is, it is a one-way form of encryption. So if you take a given input, you always get the same output. But with that output, you can never reverse the input, in, in theory. Uh, and in the case of the blockchain, it also in practice, I, I would say. So, 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 so back to what is hashing, though. H hashing is the process of um, of generating those hashes, and 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 the way that the blockchain is secured is is through a m massive application of computing brute force to um, essentially produce cryptographic verifications of every transactional block that has ever occurred. And again. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if that's still a little bit vague because that, that, is, that is astonishingly complex when you get into the details. Yes, sir? As an example, how many uh, hashes per watt do you get? Yeah, um, I, I don't remember the wattage number off the top of my head, but we'll, we'll get to that in part four. But the hashes number specifically for Ethereum Classic, I, I get 100 and, 160 million hashes per second. And as far as mining rigs go, mine is very, very modest. Mine is six GPUs. You know, the, the, the guys that are really doing this um, seriously have warehouses full of them or something, you know. Uh, and, 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 and again, I don't know hashes per watt, but at, at the end here, I, I got it such that we're, we're, we're making 160 mega hashes per second, and I think we're pulling 580 watts out of the wall. So whatever the math is on that, yeah. but. But, but back to the GPU, uh, yeah, the GPU decision, um, the NVIDIA GTX 1070, as, as best as I could tell, was pretty much optimal in terms of hashes per watt vis-a-vis -vis the price point. I think I probably could have gotten higher efficiency, but, I, but the price of the GPUs themselves would have kind of spiked beyond, beyond this point. Would that be around seven cents per hour, five hundred 
I, I honestly don't remember. And, and, and the thing about Gainesville specifically, when you try to calculate the, the wattage per hour, uh, um, if, if you're on GRU at least, it, it's a bit tricky to calculate because the, the GRU pricing model is a bit tricky where it's, there's some base number and then there's a, 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 a tiers, yeah, based on your consumption. So it, it's, it's a bit non-linear or, or non-obvious anyway to work out hashes per watt per hour I, I, I have, and we get to that later on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Can you give a sense of what 160 hashes per second is worth? W worth in terms of? Of not watts, or something else. Um, maybe how much that would, would turn around? Maybe maybe yeah, so, so, so if you're talking about like a, a financial uh, number? Uh, just in like Ethereum, you know, at 160 hashes, how many Ethereum per month do you generate? Yeah, okay, so we, we get, we drill into those numbers later, but, but the, in general, um, in terms of USD, it's a bit hard to answer that because crypt, uh, Ethereum Classic, like all cryptocurrencies, are incredibly volatile. But when I did the math initially, I, the, the profit including electrical costs approximately was about $330 per month UST. And, and what it looks like is, and, and this varies also, but, but at my 160 mega hash rig generates one ETH classic token between every day to like every day and a half or so. It, it really, it, it varies depending on something called the difficulty factor in, in mining at the time. But but it's in that it's in that ballpark though. You said an S class token. Say what? You said uh, some special tokens. S class token. Did you say? The Ethereum Classic token. Oh, Ethereum. Yeah, sorry. Oh. Eth Classic. So ETH for Ethereum Classic. ETC. We, we, ETC. Yeah. Um, if you guys don't know what Ethereum and Ethereum or, or really what Ethereum Classic is, we can talk about that after we talk about the the, the build because there's some interesting yeah there's some interesting so information. That'd be roughly 25 coins a month. What are they worth right now? Right now. Yeah. Are, it, you doing, are you doing, are we talking Ethereum Classic or Ethereum Classic, that's what he's mining. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Ethereum Classic, it's probably in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 coins per month, probably. 20, 15 to 20. P probably. I, I, again, that. So you're doing more like one every two days. Uh, yeah, see, see, again, even that number fluctuates. Uh, I, I don't want to go too down the, the mining rabbit hole because that could be its own talk, but the, in, in Ethereum and Bitcoin also, the mining is regulated based off of something called the difficulty factor, which is derived based on how many people are mining the currency at any given time. So when the difficulty factor was, was lower in F Classic, I was pumping out a little better than one coin per day. And now it seems to be closer to one coin every two days. Not quite that bad, but closer. So, so it, it's very hard to, to give you a concrete number simply because th there are so many moving ranges here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. You bet. The, yeah. Just to touch base, uh -huh. there's a website that calculates this uh, that I like a lot. Uh, right now it's guessing monthly about 16 and a half Ethereum Classic mm -hmm. based off of the 160 uh, mega hashes. So. Yeah, is that what to mine.com are you looking at or uh, crypto compare? Crypto buddy. crypto buddy, okay. My yeah. crypto buddy? Yeah, my crypto buddy. That yeah. one, that one, if, if you haven't had a chance to... I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, that one's a really good one because you can factor in um, an estimated difficulty change. Okay. So you can kind of predict where, you know, if you assume that it's going to go up, you can use the My Crypto Buddy to solve that. I appreciate that. That's good to know. So um, back to the physical build. So, you know, at, at this point I had identified the hardware that I needed to build this thing. I have chosen the GPUs and I, I picked the, uh, how's, there we go. And I picked the uninteresting hardware, the SSDs, et cetera. So with that, uh, with, with the, the computational guts chosen, uh, you know, I then turned my attention to building the, the actual chassis. 
because if you if you've ever seen a, a miner before, and here's an example. It's not mine, but it's an, it's a it's a, a, a common one. <laughs> um, y you don't you don't build mining rigs in your typical PC towers simply because you can't pack six GPUs into your typical PC tower. So I had to figure out, how, you know, how I wanted to build this thing. And uh, I, I hear some of you snickering. Yeah, the, these aren't these don't tend to be the most attractive pieces of hardware. And, and for me, uh, you know, given that this was by necessity going to be displayed at a relatively prominent place in my, you know, one room apartment, I didn't, I didn't want to build an eyesore, right? So I, I, wa I wanted to give this a little bit more thought than you zip tie some stuff together. Um, so, yeah, that's very common. And, and so here's the thing, if, if, you're, if you're doing this for profit, that's, that's the way to do it, frankly, because milk crates and zip ties are basically free, you know? So if you're doing it for profit, that's the way to do it. Um, personally, I, I built this thing, one, just because it was cool. Uh, two, to learn about the blockchain stuff, because you know, I didn't say so, but you can infer I work in technology. And um, three, uh, th there are other things I want to use this hardware for. Um, anticipating in a few months me giving a talk on password cracking with a Ethereum miner. So, mm -hmm. so, so I, I have other, that, that and I want to play with TensorFlow AI learning stuff. So, so you know, my, my, my goals weren't strictly economic here, um, but, but if they are, milk crates and zip ties is the way to go. But, but uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is a, uh, an image I got just from a uh, pretty good Vice article about Ethereum mining. And, and, you know, as we can see here, yeah, you, you build whatever scaffolding, you zip tie some GPUs to that and you're good to go. But I, I didn't like that, like I said, because uh, one, it's a bit of an eyesore, and, and two, if you've ever been around these GPU rigs before, you'll know that they put out a lot of heat. And, and just looking at this, I had a concern. Um, if, if, you see these, if you see these GPUs up close, you know, th this plate is a big heat sink, and opposite that heat sink, you've got, you know, one or two or three air intake fans. And uh, I, I didn't quite like seeing air intake fans drawn directly off the back of heat sinks like that. That just seemed like it would maybe pose an overheating risk or, or just be counterproductive. So I, I, I wasn't in love with, uh, with, with that common way of doing things. Um, but with that said, you know, I, I'd never done this before, so I, I didn't really know what I did want to do. So for, for chassis construction, I wanted to come up with some modular Lego-like way of, of being able to, to design and build this thing. So I didn't, you know, have to do this all on CAD or whatever. So I went looking around on the net for, um, for materials to build the chassis out of, and eventually I found OpenBeam, which is uh, think 8020 beam, but, but at a hobbyist scale rather than an industrial scale. These are just aluminum extrusions that you can kind of screw together vis-a-vis, -vis, or you know, similar to like an erector set or, or something like that. And uh, that, that, that looks perfect to me, you know? So I, I, I ordered those, and, and yeah, this kit, I, I probably got $200 worth of just open beams. So again, milk crates are way more economically sensible than this, but. So, so, I, so I ordered some of those, and I just started prototyping uh, u using the components that I, that I ordered in hand. You know, my, my, my build plan was to buy all the guts first and then build the chassis around the guts j just to free me from having to plan because planning is boring, tedious work that I'd rather not do, you know? But, um, so, so I thought about this for a while and the design I came up with was uh, I wanted to have the, the power supply at the bottom to minimize the risk of having the thing tip over because it's gonna be 3,000 plus dollars worth of hardware. I don't wanna knock it off my desk and, and break it. And uh, to, to uh, avoid this situation of, of drawing hot air into a cold air intake, I decided to uh, create a, a tower that's more of the conventional um, you know, PC tower form factor with three bays of two GPUs such that you'd only have one GPU that was, that was drawing air from, from a hot neighbor, right? And then I would mount the motherboard off to the side there. So this is still, it's still a little bit um, vulnerable. If I, ever, if I ever knock this off my desk, I'm gonna regret it, but so far it, it seems to be relatively stable. So there, there's the motherboard side, there's the GPU intake side, 
And if you're wondering, this is just a, uh, that, that's obviously a small power supply. That's just a little 500 water I had laying around that I was using as a placeholder at, at the time being. That, that wouldn't power this rig. So um, I, I, I bought a single GPU, the, the boring guts, the motherboard, uh, a Celeron CPU, a power supply. And before I dumped thousands of dollars into this, I wanted just to do a uh, proof of concept here, m make sure that the math checked out with approximately what I expected to see in terms of you know, the, the, the hashing performance I get out of this rig. So I bought the one GPU, I hooked everything up, I installed Claymore, which is a, a piece of mining software, and I configured it to, to do what's called dual mining, Ethereum Classic and another currency called Decred. Um, I don't want to get too deep down that that path now, but um, it, this is this is interesting. So, so Ethereum mining, if I remember correctly, is bottlenecked by the speed with which you can uh, read to and I, I think primarily read from GPU memory. So it, it is memory bound, and Decred mining, which is a, just another cryptocurrency, is is compute bound. So when you use a miner like Claymore, what, what you can actually do is mine two currencies at the same time because they essentially rely on different mechanisms within the same hardware. So uh, I, I thought that sounded interesting. I, I, I found I, I had issues with that that we'll discuss later on, but I, but I started off doing that because I, I, I thought that would be what I wanted to do. So I wired this all up. I ran it. Um, I found I was getting about... Uh, oh, and I installed Ubuntu 1704. The, 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 there are operating systems out there like um, FOS, I think, that are kind of turnkey mining softwares, but I, I know... Linux Say what? Linux coin is another. Okay, I've never heard of that one, but but sure, yeah, Linux coin then. Um, personally, I, I know and like Ubuntu and, and like my environment set up a certain way, so I just installed Ubuntu 17.04 and manual installed the packages I needed. and. Uh, ran that and I found that the numbers I was getting were about what I expected. I was getting 25 or something mega hashes out of one card. So that was satisfactory. So I, uh, you know, brought out the credit card again, ordered three more GPUs, waited for those to show up, installed them, tested them again, found that I did get a, a 4x increase in the mining hash rate. So far, so good. And uh, I, I didn't talk about this in the blog post here, but between um, buying one card and buying four cards, I had to wait a few weeks because uh, when I started doing this, everyone started doing this. Mm -hmm. And cards that I paid $400 for were selling for $700 for a while because there's, there's just a massive, massive GPU shortage and people started to do this. So I, I wasn't gonna pay $700 for one piece of hardware. So I, I, I waited for a little while for the price of GPUs to come back down. But um, six, yeah, yeah. Th that's just the on switch. Oh, okay. Yeah, eventually I clean this all up. But right now is a bunch of uh, Velcro zip ties to the frame. I just figured it all out, you know. So I ran the uh, four GPUs for a while. Saw that I did get a uh, 4x increase in hashing. So far, so good. And um, l lastly, ordered the final two, and I, I didn't think to take the appropriate pictures here, so we don't see the six installed yet, but you know, lastly I ordered the, the final two GPUs, expected this to be straightforward, I'd plug them in, it would work, and it didn't turn out to be straightforward at all. I uh, hit some issues we'll discuss momentarily with, with the BIOS. Um, because the motherboard I bought wasn't for this purpose, uh, th th there were issues whereby it just wouldn't detect more than four GPUs. That was a bit of a hassle to deal with. And uh, I, had to, I had some issues with the PCIe risers that I, I purchased. Uh, I did talk about those momentarily. So, you know, if you've ever built a PC before, you know that typically you install GPUs directly into the motherboard into a PCIe slot. Uh, again, obviously you can't do that when you're trying to stick six GPUs to something. So th there, there's cabling that you got to run from your GPU into the uh, motherboard. And this is kind of a bad photo, but you can, you can kind of see it here. You see where these cables connect into the PCIe slots. That, that's the cabling attached to the risers. Um, 
side note here for, for you guys that are considering building your own rig. Something that I learned is that th there are essentially two types of these risers. There are relatively straightforward ribbon cables, which is what, the only thing I was aware of when I first started building this, where, where you know, you, you, it's just a male and female PCIe piece of ribbon cable that does exactly what you'd expect. You, you hook, hook in one end here to your GPU, the other end to the, in the motherboard, and, and that's it. I found those are, uh, you generally don't want to use those. And, and one, according to the internet at least, um, they tend to have performance problems as they get too long. I, I don't know if it's uh, radios, radio interference flipping bits, I have no idea, but uh, apparently the, your, your, uh, your bandwidth goes down a bit if you use those. But much more importantly, what I heard is that when you use those risers, you're powering all of your GPUs through the PCIe slots on the motherboard. And most motherboards, again, aren't designed with this application in mind, so you can actually start fires by overdrawing on the motherboard. So you don't want that at all. Um, instead, what you want and what I got are risers that uh, have a couple of connections here. On the data ends, so the, the, the PCIe connector on the GPUs, and then in the motherboards, what, what you've got are two little adapters that transmit the data just via a USB 3 cable. And then to power your, your cards, um, the, the, those adapters hook directly into your power supply. So you're not, you're not pulling that through the, through the motherboard. So again, if you're building your own rig, that's very important. Don't, don't burn your house down. So that converts it to stereo. Say what? It goes out stereo. I, I, I wouldn't swear to it, but I, I think PCIe is a serial protocol maybe I'm wrong I'm not I'm not really a hardware guy actually but I but I, th I thought you might know is that okay yeah I don't know but but either way USB is serial, USB is serial. yeah I, I I don't know if PCI is or not itself I think it's classified as point to point okay yeah I don't I don't know but but either way it is absolutely being transmitted serially though between the GPU and the motherboard yeah very much so Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. That that there's you don't need to 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 push data. The, 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 that that part is never a bottleneck in mind. The bottleneck is always the rate at which you can calculate hashes, not the rate at which either the you know your your app can talk to the internet or data goes from the internet to your GPUs. That's that's never the bottleneck. So I, I think you're right. Exactly. Well, actually, probably don't need that many. You, you, you know, you need... If you're not going for high bandwidth anyway, yeah. You, you need PCIe slots, of course, but in terms of actual lanes, um, when we talk about BIOS, what, what, what the internet told me to do and what seemed to work fine is you actually turn that PCIe bandwidth down to Gen 1 or whatever, because, you, you, yeah, you really don't just need that. Oh. So, so having a, a higher setting is needlessly burning watts. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so at this point I had four GPUs running. I did encounter some BIOS problems. We'll talk about that in part two. Um, but after I got the remaining GPUs installed, I did a final round of testing, and I uh, only had two small problems. One, and this didn't really matter other than aesthetically, um, tension on the cabling between the GPUs would sometimes pull the GPUs together. I think it's a little bit hard to see, but like the, these cards are kind of far apart in their bays. These cards got pulled together. Again, not a big deal, but it did annoy me. And uh, more substantially, some of the cards were getting a little bit hot, uh, up, you know, approaching 80 degrees Celsius. I, I think what I found, I, I, I never bothered to take out a laser thermometer and, and uh, verify this, but based off of the so what the software is telling me, I'm pretty sure this card gets hotter than most of the others by about 10 Celsius, probably just because of where it's situated within the case. You know, when, when there are two more GPUs up here, this guy is kind of buried among the hardware. So when I did this round of testing, this guy was getting close to 80 degrees Celsius, which 
from what I read in the NVIDIA documentation is sort of a, I don't want to say a red line, but, it, but it, it's, it's a little hotter than you want. So those were two problems. Um, of those two problems, you know, solving the spacing problem was trivial. I, I went to good old McMaster car. I got some uh, small screws, some small threaded inserts, and bolted those directly into the rails to just make little lugs that would just mechanically force these apart. I hated myself because I measured wrong and I had like a millimeter gap between that screw head and the, and the lug, but I don't care enough to fix it. <laughs> The, the other problem, the um, the overheating problem, re required more more thinking because uh, you know the the obvious solution to the problem is mount some cooling fans to it, but I, I didn't quite know at the time how I wanted to do that, so I I punted on that problem for a little bit uh, to to think about it, and I, I I turned my attention next to mounting the uh, the hard drives and the on switch. So to mount the hard drives. Um, like, like I mentioned before, I had two drives, an SSD and an HDD, and I wanted to minimize the complexity of mounting them. So the first thing I did is, is I went on Amazon and I bought, oops, I bought a uh, converter or, or whatever that would, um, in a normal PC, it would, it would let you mount two laptop form factor drives in one single five and a quarter, whatever it is, big drive bay and uh, mounted the SSDs into this thing. And then I was thinking, you know, how do I, uh, how do I mount that to the chassis? And what I decided to do was, um, I, I have a little uh, Shapoko CNC mill, which if you don't know what that is, it, it's very similar to our Fireball CNC back there. But I designed a, uh, just a mounting panel for this guy and the blue power switch that was just dangling off the chassis earlier. So I designed this in Fusion 360. I cut it out, and uh, for the most part, it came out fine. And I mounted this directly to the uh, to the rails there, so that's all mounted, wired up. I, I say it came out mostly fine. I don't know if you can see this. I have a milling blemish. I cut right across this thing. That really kind of bummed me out. I, I, I don't know why, but the the G code I generated didn't instruct the uh, the tool to retract to its Z height before moving. So the very, the very first cut I watched the thing make was just to mar the whole surface diagonally of my piece, you know, kind of, a, kind of a downer. But again, I'm lazy. I didn't care enough to recut it, and whatever. So I had that mounted. And, and just to explain this, I, I, at the time, you know, I said, I, I'm, I'm figuring, the, figuring this out as I go. I, I was experimenting with putting a, uh, a fan here, but eventually abandoned that. So with, with this relatively easy problem solved, I, I, I went back again to try to figure out how I wanted to mount the fans. And you know I, I was happy with how that top panel came out, so I figured, well, maybe I will uh, make a similar mounting panel for the fans. And, and, and to be clear, the, the, the issue is that um, in this dimension, the rig is 150 millimeters wide, which is the, the width of the power supply exactly. But the fans that I chose to mount are 140 millimeters wide. So I had to figure out how to mate a 140 millimeter fan to 150 millimeter surface. And at the time I was thinking, I'll, I'll mill out an acrylic adapter here. And uh, this, this did mill fine, though I ended up not using it because what I found was uh, by necessity, where these screw holes had to be. They, they, they were so close together by necessity that the respective screws would compete for space and, and collide and it was kind of a whole mess. So I decided I cared more about uh, you know me being lazy than, than aesthetics here and I decided just to mount the fans directly to one rail and just let them be five millimeters off center, who cares. So, so here, here's the, the rig with uh, the three fans installed and the six GPUs installed. The last piece of hardware I had to mount, th this is a fan controller because I wanted to be able to manually adjust the fan speed versus plug these into the motherboard and, you know, I, I figured if I plug them directly into the motherboard, there would be sensors connected to the GP, connected to the CPU that would be regulating fans that aren't connected to the CPU. I figured it'd be stupid. So I, I, I just wanted a, uh, a manual fan controller. 
And my, my initial plan for this fan controller, which is a box that, again, fits in a normal uh, hard drive bay, was I wanted to mount it right here beneath that panel that I had just installed. But what I found was that uh, that was a no-go. It just didn't fit because um, this thing is four, maybe five inches deep. And uh, I, was, I was hitting this, this crossbar, right? So then the, the other plan was I was thinking, well, maybe I'll mount it off to the side of the chassis, like above the motherboard or something. Um, so I, I took the box apart to look into drilling some mounting holes to make that happen, right? And when I took the box apart, I found the whole damn thing was pretty much empty. And the only pe part that mattered at all was that single board right there, right? <laughs> so I was pretty happy to see that. So I, I, I lifted that out, came right out, and uh, decided, well, yeah, if I only need to need to accommodate an inch of depth, I can absolutely do that. So I went back uh, to my chassis here and I just removed this beam because it was structurally unimportant. By the way, I, I just realized I misspoke. The, the actual problem wasn't uh, that box hitting this beam, it was that box hitting the power switch. That's what it was, I forgot. And I, I really didn't want to move that power switch. So I, I took out this beam I designed and milled a, uh, another piece of plexi for a mounting bracket and I installed that and it, and it came out so good it looks like I knew what I was doing ahead of time when I, I, I can guarantee I very much had no idea what I was doing. So this is the end result of the build. Uh, that's it during the daytime, that's it during the nighttime. My, my uh, camera is pretty, pretty bad but take my word for it, it looks pretty cool in the dark. I'm, I'm really happy with it. Um, I, t today, I uh, threw a few more images on Imager just to give you a, a little bit of a better look at the hardware. I apologize that I, I uh, couldn't physically bring the rig in. Like I was saying when I got here, I, uh, I think the rig would stand up to being transported, but I don't want to verify it. You know, I just, just don't want to verify that. Uh, no, so um, at this point, it was maybe as loud, about half as loud as that fan, right? By the time I have it fully optimized at the end, you can barely hear it. Yeah, so. Do you think you'll be able to heat your whole house with it during the winter? Fortunately, no, no. It's it's actually, but by the end of the build, it, it's it's. Good choices. With I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. It. it, it I, I won't say it, it outputs no heat, but it out, it doesn't output much, though. Yeah, Robert. Have you run any numbers uh, for how the finances would be impacted by using indoor air versus outdoor air? I I didn't do that specifically. Um, I don't think I would do outdoor air in Florida simply because I'd be afraid that humidity would corrode the components or something. Yeah, I I, I will also say though by the end of this the energy expended in cooling is pretty minimal. I, I, I won't know until I see the numbers, but I think it's like three watts total or something for running fans. So it, it's not bad at all. It's not bad at all. But just to run down these images real quick, that's the build. Oh, one thing that I perhaps should have done better and, and maybe will do better um, in the future here Trying to find a good image for you here. I think I took one. You see these cables here? That's where the GPUs connect to the motherboard. It's it's hard to see in the photos, but but on the motherboard, these are full-length PCIe slots, PCIe 16 or whatever. But the connectors are PCIe 1 length, and as such, the cable tension wants to pull those out of the slots. They don't lock in. They just you just jam them in there and hope they stay there. And every now and then I'll have one wiggle out. So what I should have done and, and may still do is probably find a way to mount one more beam cutting across his motherboard here, which would be kind of a nice little roll cage for the motherboard anyway, and maybe mill one more piece of acrylic that I would attach to that thing that I could snap these cables into to provide some strain relief. Because again, the, the other reason I didn't want to bring this thing here, even if the chassis wasn't physically destroyed, I, I can guarantee you 
that these would have wiggled out and uh, you know the, the 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 demo gods would have smote me for sure if I if I tried to r run the miner in front of you it, it wouldn't have worked something something would have wiggled loose you know so so I, I may go back and and put some strain relief on those cables that's the uh, view from the top there's my mar mocking me every time I look at it yeah I could make it look intentional take the was the the wabi sabi approach or whatever is that what the term is I don't know. Just paint the lower corner <laughs> color so it looks you know, clear and colored. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that concludes the physical build. Are there any questions about the physics before the physical build before we move on to the software? Yes, sir. Why did you need fan controllers? Is there a reason that you turn them down? You need an interval on with them? Yeah. Don't you let them full speed all the time? Well. One, I just kind of wanted manual control. I, I just generally like manual controls, but a, a bit more um, importantly, I'm not a hardware guy, but my understanding is that had I plugged the fans directly into the motherboard, those fans would have been controlled based off of temperature readings coming from the CPU and other motherboard mounted components. And, and in my mind, it didn't make sense to let that happen. So, so I, I, I wanted to fully decouple motherboard telemetry from my fan speed. And I figured the easiest way to do that would just be with some control knobs, you know? So do you run it at 100%, 80, 60? Um, uh, um, at this point in the build, I was running about 100. By the end, I, I have them in the lowest possible setting. Yeah. That's how you got it quiet. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And again, we'll talk about that later, but um, I was able to, to cool off the whole rig by uh, undervolting the GPUs so they output less heat, yeah. Okay. Uh, could you say a little about the software stack you use for the milling 3D parts? Yeah, uh, so, so I'll say, I'll, I'll disclaim, first of all, that I know even less about that than I do this stuff. But what I've been using recently is um, Fusion 360 for CAD and CAM. Uh, th that's the Autodesk product. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it. It is free if you're a hobbyist. Um, my only complaint with it so far is that it is Windows only, and that's always a pain for me, but uh, I, I really like it. It, ha it has a bit of a steep learning curve, but not, but, but not an unreasonable one, given that, in, in my opinion, CAD is just complicated intrinsically, and that's all there is to it, you know? So, so I'm a big fan of, of Fusion 360. And then my Shapoko, it has a gerbil uh, board. And for G-Code Sender, I actually wrote my own G-Code Sender in Node. I think I talked about it on demo night or something. Maybe I didn't. But anyway, I have my own CLI-based Node G-Code Sender. Yeah. See so other questions? Yeah, so the CPU was literally the cheapest Celeron I could find. Um, Side note on that, uh, the, the hackerspace benefited from my stupidity here because I, I, I first I bought a CPU of the wrong socket type, uh, and not only did I do that, I actually bought two of the two of them at the wrong socket type. So, so if anyone needs Celerons for the 1150 socket, they're they're donated now. Um, and, and and the RAM was was likewise. I got four gigs of the cheapest RAM I could find. Yeah. It, it was really just a matter of uh, there, there wasn't really anywhere else to put it, you know? And um, that, that seemed like a, a sensible enough way to solve that problem. Uh, I, again, allowing for a little bit of risk, at least, with, with regards to tipping. If, if, it all, if it ever falls over, I might not feel like it was a sensible decision anymore. But for the time being, it's working okay. And, and also, it, it's really nice to work on, too. Just nothing in its way, you know? Yeah. Are your riser cables shielded now, or uh, are they different lengths? Are they all the same length? Have you noticed any difference in performance? Th th there is no difference in performance among the cards. Um, you, 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 you raised uh, an issue that I, 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 I skipped over accidentally. When I installed these, 
I, I had two problems. One was the bias problem I did, I did talk about with four, uh, two cards weren't detected. I also found though that two of the USB cables that shipped with the risers were just defective outright. So when I discovered that, I lost confidence in the uh, USB cables those things came with, and I just bought six from Amazon, uh, that which, which are shielded. And uh, I'm reluctant to say high quality because who knows both with with these things and and Amazon, but so far they've been performing okay, and and, and these are shielded at least to the extent that any USB cable is shielded. Yeah, certainly more so than the ribbon cable cable style would be. Yeah. Other questions about the physical build? Okay. I'll go a little faster through this next part because this is objectively boring. Um, the uh, so so like I said, you know, when I installed the final two GPUs, I found that the motherboard wouldn't detect them. I I didn't know why, but a, a bit of googling turned up the answer pretty quick. Um, all I, I all I had to do was I had to flash a new motherboard BIOS because. Um, Fortunately, the, the vendor realized that these boards are being used in miners and, and offered a, a patch. Flip one or two settings, and uh, then I could boot the miner, SSH into it, and use a, an NVIDIA tool called in, NVIDIA SMI to confirm that six GPUs were detected. Now I say I SSH into it to, to, to uh, determine that because after I applied that fix, there, there was no video output anymore, so I traded one problem for another. And um, y you know, to be entirely honest, I I'm still not entirely sure what the root cause of this problem was. W what I had found is that, again, after I, I had updated the BIOS, the machine, when I booted it, it would post, and I would, I would see it run its post test. But right after it finished posting, the screen would turn black entirely and when I started mining it would draw like random blocks of colors to the output and I frankly have no clue what that what that is doing obviously it's trying to produce some kind of video output but it's but it was doing it wrong so I, I, again I, I really don't know what the problem was but the the workaround I came up with is I went back into BIOS and I switched from pushing video output with one of the mining cards and I switched to use the integrated Intel video that's on the CPU itself. You know, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, whatever it is these days. I, I, I used that GPU and, and, and that worked. So I, I wrote that off as good enough and uh, booted it and uh, this time found that it would post and it would uh, get me into a shell. Um, the, the, the way I set up most of my computers is I don't start X automatically. I don't see a, a reason to do that. So I, I, I boot it into a shell. I typed start X and then the resultant video output was uh, nauseatingly jittery. I didn't know what that was all about. So I, I poked around for a couple of minutes so and what I found was that um, there's a there's a xorg.conf which is a, vid uh, a monitor configuration file that was hanging around from when the, the NVIDIA was a GPU. I deleted that, rebooted it, and uh, checked the diff between the prior XORG and the new XORG and realized that the, the only issue was that previously the video out was in 1080i when I had a 1080p monitor. So made that fix and, and, and then I could boot into a, a uh, functioning graphical environment. Questions on any of the boring BIOS stuff? Cool. All right, so now at this point I had a working rig. So now what I decided to do was um, actually check the assumptions that I had made regarding what currencies are the most profitable to mine. And the first thing I did was I took some starting benchmarks. Dual mining Ethereum Classic and Decred. Um, I was getting 150 mega hashes per second, 151 mega hashes per second on Ethereum Classic, uh, 1.5 giga hashes per second on Decred, and it was pulling 960 watts out of the wall as, as measured by a kilowatt. So that wasn't a software number, that was a, a kilowatt telling me that. 
and uh, to, to, you know, I, I, I mentioned dual mining previously. Um, it is also possible to, to dual mine a couple other currencies, like in, in place of Decred, there's, there's, there's a coin called Sia coin, Library coin, Pascal and Pascal Lite. You can, you can uh, dual mine all of those, but just personally from a fundamentals perspective, I'm not interested in that. So for me, dual mining was, was a matter of ETC and DCR or, or nothing. Well, <clears throat> what was the question for you? oh, the question was why wasn't I interested in any of these coins? And 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 um, f for me, see a coin is technologically interesting, but I don't see any potential for profit in it ever. Um, see a coin, if you're not familiar with the project, is an attempt to provide a mechanism for implementing file storage over the blockchain. So, so what, you, what, what you can do is essentially lease out unused hard disk space and, and let people rent it. And, and, and again, from a technological perspective, I think that's really cool. From a capitalist perspective here, uh, S3 is cheap. Glacier is so cheap, it's basically free. There, I can't imagine any business ever trusting you know, corporate data to see a I don't personally know any users, like like just consumers, that would need terabytes and terabytes worth of distributed file storage. To, to me, there's no business case there. So so SIA didn't really do it for me. Um, library just seemed intrinsically dubious. I, I I don't I don't even know what problem they think they're trying to solve. And <laughs> and, and Pascal and Pascal Lite, likewise, it, it seemed to be. <coughs> Bitcoin, but with another consensus mechanism or something, it, it, it just didn't interest me. I guess you know. I, in fairness, they might be great projects. I, I didn't do a lot of due diligence, but but the cursory research I did just didn't interest me. I see hand go up or not? Oh, okay, no, no sweat, no sweat. Oh, sold. <laughs> so the next thing I did then was I, I wanted to compare a couple of different versions of Claymore with another mining software called Ethminer. And I wanted to compare the numbers that I would get when I was uh, using the different versions of Claymore and Ethminer, both dual mining Eth Classic and Decred and single mining Eth Classic. And I broke it down. And, and someone asked before, what was I getting, mega hashes per watt? These are the numbers. So I was getting between, you know, 0.15 and 0.18 mega hashes per watt. Oh, I guess the question is mega hashes per watt per dollar. That I still don't know. I'd have to do the math. But, um, that, you know, that, that, that'd be the starting point for that math. But anyway, I did kind of a, uh, you know, shootout here among these different pieces of software. And w what I found was that... Um, Single mining Ethereum Classic was barely, barely, barely the most price efficient approach. W one thing I should mention here, th you see this fee column? So Claymore is a closed source piece of software which kind of biases me personally against it by default. Um, and in addition to being closed source, if you were using it to single mine, 1% of the time spent mining will mine on behalf of the project author. I don't blame them for that. You guys got to make a living or whatever, but, but, but that's something that I had to account for. And if you are dual mining using it, 2% uh, of your mining time goes to the project author. So, you know, so, so in terms of There wasn't, I didn't find great documentation answering that question. The, the way it appeared to, to work based off of the, the output though, is it, it wasn't mining, it, it wasn't funneling profits or anything. It was just partitioning out mining time. Because, you know, I, I would watch it mining on my behalf and then it would say switch to dev mining or whatever and start mining. So I think what the author did is 
you know, in the compiled binary that I can't see, he has he has pointers to his own wallet, and and probably presumably for one percent of the time the software is running, it mines on his behalf rather than mine. Again, I don't begrudge him that, but in in doing the math, it was something I had to account for. Yes, sir. Uh, could the results of that be be built into the mega hashes per second, or do you have to calculate it separately? I I I, I did, I I did that math, so. Here are the raw numbers I was getting. Oh, mega hash. Exactly. Yeah. No. No sweat. Uh, so and, and then yeah. So the, the the final numbers here were mega hashes per second adjusted for the mining fee d divided by watts. Yeah. And then that would be the starting point for watts versus GRU billing tiers. Yeah. So the, my, my my takeaway from this was that um, dual mining, Ethereum Classic. What was less efficient, so, sorry, sorry, dual mining Ethereum Classic plus Decred was best case 5% less efficient, yielding just Eth Classic. Um, and, and also I realized that, that dual mining increased power consumption by about 9%. So from those numbers, I used a site called What to Mine to um, figure out what this would mean in terms of profits to determine whether or not it was even worth dual mining at all. And going strictly by the numbers, uh, the, the answer is yes, but barely. Um, if, if I dual mined, I would generate $313, $314 per month profit. If I single mine, it'd be $311 per month profit. However, um, in practice, I, I didn't really like the dual mining. Uh, w what I found was, uh, w one, and critically, you know, I actually dual mined for a few weeks before I came to these final decisions here. And what I found was when I looked at the hash rate that I was allegedly getting for Decred per the output on my mining software, I saw that number is about 1.5 giga hash per second. When I logged in and checked my mining pool though, it was some number like 800 mega hash or something. And, and I frankly have no idea what accounted for that difference. I, I have no idea what that was about. So that was a big red flag to me. The, the other problem I had was, you know, I, I had this rig hooked to a kilowatt the whole time I was setting all this up. And when I would solo mine Eth Classic, it would pull 960 out of the wall forever, period. When I dual mined, it would fluctuate 100 watts or so up and down rapidly. And my problem with that was, uh, this is just a hunch, but my, my assumption was that that power consumption would have a corresponding small temperature fluctuation that accompanied it. And my fear was that if I ran this thing indefinitely like that, there would be thermal expansion, expansion contraction, that would eventually tear the hardware apart. So for me, you know, given that I was seeing numbers that didn't add up even grossly, um, in addition to the fact that I'm, I, I just said I was probably you know, wearing down my hardware, I, I decided to, to solo mine. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. There we go. Got, all right. I decided, where, oh, I'm at the bottom of the article. Like, why well, I want to scroll down. Uh, it's, it's the end. I, I decided to solo mine rather than, than dual mine. The, the, the other thing, too, um, l lastly, uh, I, I, again, I, I can't overstate how irritating it was having a space heater next to my desk in the middle of summer, you know, this, this miner. So if, if I could drop 100 watts by solar mining, I mean, that, that in itself was, was worth it to me. Any questions on, on this? Yeah. A little bit, maybe back to hardware. How easy is it, because I haven't set up one of these miners, but how yeah. easy is it to just turn it off for a second and be like, okay, I got to deal with stuff. You know, I'm here, the room's hot, all right, cool, I'm leaving, what I want. Once you get it all installed, <clears throat> it's relatively easy. The, the, the only thing I do, um, again, uh, again, given that I'm paranoid about tearing up my GPUs, is I will kill the mining process, crank the manual cooling fans up to maximum, and run those until I see the, uh, the cooling fans on the GPUs spin down. Because on, on, on the 1070s, at least on the BIOS and mine are running, when the load falls below a certain number, the, the fans just stop. So I, I like to do that rather than just a direct shutdown, just so I can gradually cool the cards off and then shut down. 
but but again th that that's probably not even necessary um, so other than that you could just control C kill the process shut it down doesn't matter there, there's there's not a big boot up time or shut off time or anything like that for the mining software itself <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> uh, I was I was wondering what your total cost was and what you how long you expect it to actually be used before it's obsolete so the the total cost you know I, I didn't really record keep as uh, thoroughly as I should have but it was probably in the ballpark of around thirty three thirty four hundred dollars um, that's a little more expensive than it would have been under normal circumstances because again like I said the price of GPUs went up so I, I didn't pay seven hundred dollars four hundred for a four hundred dollar GPU but I did pay like five hundred fifty once or once or twice for a four hundred dollar GPU so that cost was a little bit inflated one thing I will say is uh, I went into this knowing that I was going to use this hardware for other purposes, you know, for, for TensorFlow work, for hash cracking, etc. If I didn't know that were the case, I'm not sure if I would have done this because I, I don't know if this will ever pay for itself. It, it, it's, it's, it's a big mystery. But for me, this was hardware I needed anyway, and uh, it could potentially pay for itself or do better. So I, I was happy to spend the money. Do you have a question, Robert? If you, uh, if you were to graph the profit like by second instead of by month, would that be a chunky graph in steps? And if so, how long do those steps take where it bites off a chunk and then succeeds? And how much do you lose by killing that process if you don't time it right? So that, that's a little hard to answer, again, in that over the last three weeks, I've seen the price of ETH Classic go from 15 bucks a coin to 25 to 11, back to 15 or something. But if you just want to make the assumption that it's like 20 bucks per coin, um, I never need to kill this for more than a couple of minutes. And, and generally, I run it for weeks without killing it. So unless you take it offline for a long time, you're not losing a lot of money. D does that answer your question? Um, well, no, I was wondering like, how long it takes between it Oh, oh, that—that th th that is, of course, random. But looking at the output, it seems to generate a share several times per minute. Or I've never seen it go longer than a minute without hitting a share. So, yeah. So you don't lose a lot of work. It's not—it's not like every five, six hours or something you hit a hash. Yeah. Yeah. So Bitcoin, there are mining pools. Is there? Is that what you're doing with the PC2? It, it is. I'm using um, Nanopool. Okay. Yeah, and, and so far I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. So essentially, when the pool wins the prize, uh, it says how much did you contribute, and then it just divides that evenly? Th that's exactly right, yeah. Maybe the pool manager gets some sort of that, that's exactly right. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce that concept really quick. So, so in cryptocurrency mining, you can, you can do what's called solo mine or pool mine. Solo mining is on your own. You're, you're hashing against the blockchain and you're hoping you find a hash. And if, if you find one that works, you're paid the block reward for doing so. Um, generally speaking, to my knowledge, taking that approach only makes sense very, very early on in the life cycle of a coin when its difficulty factor is very low. In the case of Ethereum Classic, doing that probably wouldn't make sense. In the case of Bitcoin, it is, it is truly absurd to even consider that. Um, so, 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 so that's solo mining. Um, the, the, the alternative is, is what's called pool mining, where, like Michael was explaining, the way pool mining works is that essentially there's a centralized web service that coordinates the mining activity of any number of participants and the way rewards are paid out is that that mining pool software tracks how much work every individual miner has con contributed to finding a block and block rewards are paid out in proportion so, 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 so you know on the blockchain the blockchain itself will be paid mining rewards when a, when, a, when a block is found, and then based on how much 
work each individual miner contributed to that discovery, um, which is tracked via mining shares, the, the, that, that reward is, is split up among the miners after the fact. So that, those are the two. The, the, the mining pools tend to take one or two percent as, as what they call their, their pool fee or whatever. I think mine, nanopool, I think they take one percent. So it's, it's fairly reasonable. You know. Other, yeah? Um, if someone actually went out from over to dual mining, is there, like, how does that make sense above just optimizing for one coin that gets the most profit? Is there, like, not a linear relationship between? It's pretty cool. So again, I'm, I'm not a crypto guy, I'm not a hardware guy, but my understanding is that with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, the, the, the cryptographic function you're performing is essentially bottlenecked on the speed with which you can read from GPU RAM. And with the coins that you can dual mine with, those are CPU bound. So essentially you're performing a CPU bound and a compute bound function on the same piece of hardware. And, and because they aren't really competing for resources, there's only like a very minuscule impact to either while mining for both. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Okay, so now we have a working piece of hardware. We fixed the BIOS bugs and we have optimized our mining strategy. So at this point I, I had decided to solo mine Ethereum Classic using Ethminer because that's what was the most profitable. The, the other thing too, not to disparage the guy's work, but I also just disagreed with the way Claymore was set up. Like you, you download the repo, you extract it, and within the source repo, you configure it via some plain text file. And then as it ran, it would write logs to that same file with source and configs and also download binaries that I think contain crypto. It was, it was just kind of gross and how that was all configured. So NF minor was a bit more sensible. Robert. Did you uh, look for any other people experiencing the discrepancy between what the pool reported and what the software reported? I, I, I didn't. That would have been a, uh, I, now that you mentioned it, I should have done that. For, 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 for me, I was kind of only minimally interested in Decred as a project anyway. So once I realized that this was this was going to be yet another headache, I just walked away from it. But but now that you pointed out, I would be kind of curious to see what that was all about because I really don't know. So we have working hardware, and we have a financially optimized mining strategy. The last thing I uh, set out to do here was to now compute optimize the rig, you know. And uh, within the the world of mining. Generally, compute optimize means find a way to overclock your GPUs to get a higher hashing rate out of them or decrease your power consumption. And the other thing I wanted to do was find a way to increase the utilization of the hardware more broadly. So I went into this again by taking some opening benchmarks um, using the uh, current F miner to solo mine F classic. I was getting 160 mega hashes pulling 910 watts out of the wall, and the GPUs were running between 60 and 72 degrees Celsius, and I had the fans in place. So still a little hot, though backed away from that red zone. And then I did just a little bit of uh, simple math here to try to determine how that energy was, was being divvied up among the components, and, and what it looked like was that the GPUs were pulling about 770 777 watts. The motherboard and CPU were pulling 126 watts and the chassis fans were pulling seven watts. And I did that by um, using the kilowatt to get the 910 total consumption number. Um, and then this number I got from a tool called NVIDIA SMI, which is a command line tool that just gives you diagnostic information on, on video cards. So in software, I got this 777 number then I just unplugged the GPU fans, looked at the kilowatt, did the math. There we go. And then, and then uh, w one externality that wasn't captured in these numbers is this thing was at the time pumping a ton of heat into my apartment. So without question, I was running my air conditioner more than I would have been otherwise. And uh, again, I, I could quantify that, 
but I'm very confident that the uh, energy bill, that the, the impact was non-trivial. I can tell you when I got my energy bill that month, I was horrified. Um, it was easily double what it, what it normally was. So that, that was no good. So the first thing I set out to do was I wanted to, to overclock the GPUs because that's a pretty, uh, th th that's the common first step you would take. And um, the, the internet told me that there were two tools I could use to do this. One was called NVIDIA Settings, the other is called NVIDIA SMI. And again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a Linux perspective here on Windows. I think there are the, I, I, there, there are similar tools, they may have different names. I don't know, but I don't, NVIDIA SMI may not exist on Windows, I'm not sure. So I, I first attempted NVIDIA Settings because that's what a lot of people seem to do. But I uh, pretty quickly ran into trouble. Um, what I noticed was that NVIDIA Settings would simply not detect my GPUs at all. And uh, this doesn't make any sense to me from a software engineering perspective other than that this is probably a legacy mess that NVIDIA has had on their hands for 15 years. But it looks like NVIDIA Settings won't see any video card that isn't configured in xorg.conf. And given the BIOS issues I had previously, I wasn't using those GPUs to drive my video anymore. So these, these weren't in xorg.conf. So um, I, I did find some clever Reddit users with workarounds regarding creating dummy monitor interfaces in xorg and blah, blah, blah. It looked like a massive headache and I, I walked away from it. I didn't, I didn't want to deal with any of that. The other option available was uh, NVIDIA SMI tool allegedly allows you to overclock on a per application basis whereby you simply specify use X amount of video RAM and X amount and, and X clock speed for any given process. I try that on my system. I don't know what to say other than it just, it just doesn't work. That's all there is to it. It doesn't work. Um, that, 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 uh, the, the, the supported, the application specific clocks just weren't supported on my GPUs. I don't really know why. I, I found a few forum threads of guys saying that this functionality isn't supported on consumer grade NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I couldn't find any official NVIDIA documentation backing that up, but at this point I was, I was over this whole thing. So I decided 160 mega hashes is good enough. And I turned my attention then to GPU undervolting. Um, in in, in undervolting what you're doing, you aren't adjusting clock speeds, at least not manually. You're just setting a power budget that you want the, the GPUs to conform to. And uh, th this turned out to be actually a, a real pleasure to use. Uh, once again, there's just an NVIDIA SMI command I had to issue where you, you specify a power level in watts. And um, the GPUs, however they do it, I don't know, will attempt to self-modify their own timings to meet your power budget. And, and that worked very easily. So, so all I did here to, to work out the undervolting is I ran my miner, looked at the hash rate, lowered the power budget, ran the miner again, looked at the hash rate, and uh, did that incrementally and, and found that, um, you know, I, I started at 160 mega hashes pulling like 135 watts out of the wall per card. And I was able to, to step that down to 85 watts per card without any impact in the hash rate, which was weird. Um, that surprised me. But I, I, my, my assumption is that um, there, was, there was some clock that, that was running faster than necessary given some other bottleneck in, in, the, in the mining software. So, so just making that change, I was able to save 270 watts for, in, in exchange for nothing, no, no performance harm. Yeah, I was very pleased and surprised by that. Uh, and, and, and unsurprisingly, that's where the bulk of the, the savings were to be had. But I, I, I then went back into the motherboard BIOS to see if I could squeeze out a, a few more watts. And I, uh, I, I simply turned off motherboard features that I didn't think I was going to need and um, lowered clock settings, lowered bus settings, just just Lowered, lowered or turned off everything I, I, I didn't think I was going to need. And doing that saved me two watts. Not a big deal, but no reason not to do it. Lastly, with the uh, <coughs> reduction in GPU power consumption, 
and, and thereby the reduction in heat output. I was able to turn the fans down to the lowest settings and uh, that made them totally quiet. That saved two watts and, and the rig ran cool after this. So the, the final benchmarks were 160 mega hash per second, pulling 585 out of the wall and the GPUs ran from 55 to 68 degrees, which is much, much better. It's great it, yeah, I was really happy with, with how that all went. Yeah, you bet. And this is all on my blog, too. If you, if you ever want to refer back to any of this, that's all there. Yeah. And that's the blog, it's a site using your name? Uh, yeah, um, my, mine is Chris Lane. My site is chris-allen-lane.com. Yeah, this is just, just my blog. Last thing, so, so now that the uh, Ethereum Classic mining has been compute optimized, the last thing I wanted to do, and, and this is an ongoing project, I didn't finish this, I want to increase the utilization of this hardware in general. So, for example, Ethereum Classic is best mined with GPUs, but there are other currencies that have other bottlenecks, and I want to mine them too, because this thing's running, I'm paying the power bill, I might as well get every bit of crypto out of it that I can. So, I haven't done this yet, but um, there, there are coins that are based off of a... Uh, an algorithm called Kryptonite, for, for one, that are better mined on CPUs than GPUs. And I want to configure them, I, I want to configure one of them to, to mine using the CPU, which is mostly otherwise idle while the GPUs are doing their thing. Uh, likewise, I, uh, just despite my relative disinterest in the project, I will probably try out SIA because you know, the, the, the way I look at this, there are currencies that you can mine using GPUs, CPUs, hard disk space, and, and I might as well you know, utilize all of those to the best of my ability. And, and, and lastly, to saturate my network connection a bit more, I'll probably run a Tor node on here too, which isn't a uh, crypto mining thing, it's just a good net citizen thing. You know. Did I see a hand go up? No, okay, sorry. Well, I, I had a question about yeah. things I've wondered, basically I have access to free power. Nice. Um, and I want to try and set something up. Um, but I'm, I guess it's all on like a distributed or like, you know, shared internet somewhere. What sort of internet connections do you need and should you set up something and be running it through Tor or something like that? I don't know like, what. I'm not a Tor expert at all, but I have run a node on and off for a couple of years. Um, there, there's really not a lot to it other than download the package to your system, run it. Um, worst case, you got to open up a port or two in a firewall. But, but for the most part, there's, there's not a lot you need to know about how it works. There, there's not a lot I know about how it works. The, the only thing I, I will say is if there's, only, if there's one decision you need to be aware of when setting up a Tor node, you need to decide whether you want to be what's called an exit node. Um, the way Tor works is that uh, an internet request comes in, it's proxied through hundreds, thousands, I don't know, however many Tor nodes internally, and eventually it reaches the internet. The bridge between that, that Tor interior and the internet, that's called an exit <coughs> node. And um, you are potentially exposing yourself to legal liability and or unwanted police raids or whatever if there is objectionable traffic coming from your house to the net. Yeah, yeah. So, so personally, I've, I've always run an internal node only. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the exit nodes to guys with legal departments or whatever. Um, but, but beyond knowing that, there's, there's not a huge amount you need to, to, need to know to run a Tor node. Yeah. Yeah. Did you already go over the first two, the, the BTC, LTC? Uh, BTC, LTC, that's Bitcoin, Litecoin, and, and Doggy, the meme currency. Okay. Yeah, um, it, it, it's completely futile to attempt to mine any of those with GPUs anymore. But again, just for the sake of being a good citizen here, I'll probably run full nodes um, j j just to help strengthen the blockchain or, or whatever. But, but yeah, that, that, that's more being a good citizen and, and less about profit because you, you, you can't GPU mine those anymore profitably. And the grid coin? Gridcoin is cool. 
I, I haven't fully set this up yet, but th that, that'll probably be my, my next weekend project. Um, has anybody in here ever heard of Boink? You know what Boink is? Yeah, I, I, what is it? Say, say what? Yeah, okay, yeah. I, th I think it's the Berkeley Open Infrastructure Network Computing, something or other, anyway. W what it is is a, um, a piece of software that lets users donate their spare CPU or GPU cycles to doing scientific computing. So for, for like the last 10 years or something, I've been participating in Boink, uh, crunching numbers for SETI. Um, and, 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 and Boink allows you to do that kind of thing. Gridcoin is like a coinification or whatever of, of Boink. You are rewarded for Boink participation in Gridcoin. Um, I, I, I will say basically nobody knows about Gridcoin. Uh, yeah, Grid... my favorite cryptocurrency. Say what? It is mine too. Yeah, I, there, 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 right now there's no money to be made in it, but I'm happy to participate in this just again for the sake of good citizenship because I think it's a cool project, you know. Um, so, so yeah, gr gr Gridcoin rewards you for Boink participation, and uh, yeah, again, those coins are worth basically nothing now. Maybe they will increase in value, maybe not. I don't know. But either way, I'm happy to participate in that just because it's for a good cause or whatever, you know. Um, and, and like I said before, you know, this machine may or may not pay for itself. I don't know, but I'm happy I built it. One, certainly just to learn about all this stuff, but two, I will be using it for password hash cracking and uh, probably AI experimentation with TensorFlow in the future. So I, I, I don't know if I can tell you guys, yeah, go, you know, go build one of these. You'll be an Ethereum millionaire, no doubt. Um, but given that I wanted to build one of these anyway, I figured maybe it'll pay for itself if I get lucky, you know. Yeah. But, uh, how, so it looked like a lot of what you were doing kind of ended up in the command line having to tweak settings that, you know, yeah. for me, that's, that's a little probably beyond my skill level. Sure. Area. I mean, how accessible, it seems a little beyond what I can do. I mean, how, how accessible do you think it is to somebody that's like, I mean, I see a command line, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, I sure, sure. this. I, 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 um, I, what, what you might want to do, say, say what? Help him build one if he sets up. <laughs> sure, sure. Power yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what you might want to do is, is I, I think most people actually do the mining on Windows. I'm a Linux guy, so I did Linux. But if, but if you want to build these in Windows, you, you definitely can. And, and actually, you won't have the problems I had regarding NVIDIA, NVIDIA settings not seeing your cards. You gotta be a little bit more careful with the hardware you purchased because there were there were issues with Windows 10 and GTX 1080 cards, some driver issue whereby you're getting a garbage garbage hash rate like three mega hashes or something out of the cards. So I don't know. Make make sure that's resolved. But 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 you could you could do this in Windows if you wanted to, and not to deal with all the Linux command line stuff. Yeah. Have you looked into Have you looked into any of the ASIC setups and those type of things? But by design. Th there are no ASICs, ASIC miners for Ethereum. Right, right. Yeah. I was wondering if you've looked into them in general as far as... I, 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 I am um, acquainted with them in a very broad way. My, my, my friend Marcos has one that we're going to set up to do some Bitcoin mining, um, which again at this point may or may not be profitable with the hardware that we have specifically, but, um, but we have some of the hardware to play with. Yeah, yeah. But, but that, that'll never be a factor that, that'll never be in play in, in the Ethereum world because Ethereum was designed to defeat those. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, thanks a lot, guys. This has gone a little long, so I think I'll end the presentation now, but I'll hang around for a little while, so if you want to chat about anything else, uh, just, just walk on up. Thank you.